Mozak to you. Dr. Mozak is um, a world-renowned scholar in Adlerian psychology and one of the founding influences here uh, for us in the Twin Cities. He was he he came here and presented before there was an institute, which was before there was a school. Um, so all of us owe him, whether we know it or not, for the school being here, uh, for for his not only his writing and his teaching, but also for the existence of our institution. Um, it's a it's a huge debt that we owe him. Um, he also, uh, with his mentor Rudolf Dreikers and colleagues. Bernard Schulman and Robert Powers, he founded what has become the Adler School of Psychology in Chicago. Um, and he's made it his life work not only to spread the ideas of Adler and Rikers, but to continue to develop those ideas and to encourage others to develop those ideas as they put them into practice. And that's one of the most intriguing things for me about Dr. Mozak is that he writes and teaches both from a scholarly point of view and also from a practicing point of view. Um, and, and so that makes his, his work so valuable to me. Um, he's contributed to our understanding of the spiritual in psychotherapy, to the use of multiple therapists, um, to group and couples therapy, and, um, and he, of course, he is well known for advocating the use of humor in psychotherapy, which we all enjoy. Um, he and his wife, Bertie, supported hundreds of students with their generosity over the years, including providing meals and housing. He's such an example of uh, that spirit of, of community not only for um, us, but for the students and scholars in Chicago, in Toronto, in Vancouver, in Maryland, all over the world. Uh, it's, it's a really great pleasure to have him here with us today. Um, and uh, just one caution to Dr. Mozak. We want to let him know that we still have the paper that he presented when he first arrived in Minnesota. What was it at? You know, I'm not sure, but Sue says we still have it. Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Uh, lifestyle. So, um, so we still have it. So this session is likely to last for a long time. Congratulations, Dr. Mozak, and thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you. And Thank you for the introduction. And now I'll introduce myself very, very briefly. I'm Harold Mozak. I'm age 90. And I still teach full-time at the Adler School in Chicago and maintain a private practice. Other than that, I'm retired. <laughs> I'm interested, Sue, in knowing that you have a copy of the first paper that I presented up here. It probably was in 1970 or 71 or thereabouts. Well, I dated with respect to Dreikers' death in 72, so it was somewhat before that. But I learned that somebody got us beat. The first paper, term paper, I ever wrote at the University of Chicago in psychology, which would make it about 1943, one of my colleagues found somewhere and maintains in the files. At that time, we didn't know anything about the Rorschach test. 
and uh, there was only one person in Chicago, Samuel Beck, a noted psychologist who had studied Rorschach abroad because they didn't teach it here in Chicago. And uh, uh, that is uh, a bit over 70 years ago or something like that. But it's nice to know that people have keepsakes. <laughs> Uh, the IT person. Uh, is Paul here? Okay, we'll do it this way. I can see my notes. Now, I tell you that I'm 90 and that I still teach and I still write and I still practice because it has something to do with the topic I've been asked to speak about today. That's better. This topic this early afternoon is not one chosen by me. It was chosen right here by students or a student or whatever. And I've spoken on it several times in the last 20 years, people are interested in knowing where Adlerian psychology is and where it's going. And uh, I generally receive a great ovation for having spoken it. And later, I find that everything I've said has fallen on deaf ears. Uh, you know, you gave that speech at NASAP in 2001, et cetera. It was wonderful. I don't remember what you said, but I do remember it was received very, very well. I hope you people will make the difference and actually do something about what I'm going to talk about. In terms of this particular topic, I'm not a prophet. If I were a prophet, I could tell you, 10 years from now will this, and 20 years from now will that. I can't even behave like a Old Testament prophet because then I'd have to scold you and tell you how badly you're sinning and that kind of thing, and then offer you some kind of salvation. It's not my style. I'm too much, as an Adlerian, I'm too much of an optimist to tell you all the things that you're doing wrong and things that you're not doing and all of that. So please receive this as a challenge, as an invitation. There is much to do, whether it is today or the next decade or the decade after that, to improve Adlerian psychology. If you don't do something about it, and I'm not talking about uh, general you, but every one of you, if you don't do something about it, you will fulfill something that I said many years ago. Adlerian psychology will never live and it will never die. I have some evidence for that, having been around for a long time. NASAP has about a thousand members Every year they get a hundred new members, and every year they lose a hundred new, member, uh, new old members, and consequently the census of the society stays roughly at 1,000. It's because people don't work at it, and I invite you to work at it. None of these things that I'm going to discuss in this talk are going to happen if somebody doesn't do them, just talking about them ain't gonna help. And Adlerians are great talkers. <laughs> well, I can give you an example which probably nobody here knows. <coughs> we have a standing resolution in NASAP passed by, I think, unanimous vote. Well, maybe not unanimous vote because I didn't vote for it. And that is that making prejudice statements in print or orally or whatever is psychopathology. 
and should be listed. You're startled. <laughs> and should be listed in the DSM. <coughs> Nobody knows about it. It was never publicized. It went into the minutes of the school. Some people at the time read it and thought whatever they thought of it and then promptly forgot about it. So even if it is psychopathology, and even more if it isn't pathology, we haven't done anything about it. So we have to do a job of recruitment. Now, one thing I've discovered in talking with Edlerians over the world, because for almost 50 years I traveled all over the world every weekend of the school year to teach somewhere. So I've met a lot of Edlerians domestically and internationally. And they talk a lot but don't do much because they think only in terms of large, massive projects that require a billion dollars to perform and don't think simple thoughts which might easily get done by anybody. They don't have to be done by the so-called pros in Adlerian psychology. So in these teaching sessions that I've had all over the world and including here, I've always carried NASAP applications. And I passed them out immediately when people were enthusiastic, when they were eager, when they saw a demonstration and said, gee, where can I learn that? I had an application ready for them. When I told NASAP about this, they were amazed. What a startling proposition. <laughs> And because they think big, they forget the little things that we can do. We tend to operate like the advertising department of Wrigley Chewing Gum. For decades, they did not spend one penny on advertising. They felt that their product was so good it didn't need any advertising. People would just go around chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing without any ad advertising. We operate the same way. It is so bad sometimes that I was asked to testify in court and a psychologist testifying for the other side, it was a custody case, uh, tried to get acquainted with me and I told her who I was. And she said, you mean there are still Adlerians in this country? Wow. And I said, yes. I said, we even have a school. Really? So we have to get rid of that kind of thinking. We have to let the world know that we're here. And we don't very, very often. Occasionally, when we have a convention in somebody's town, somebody puts a squib in the paper saying we're meeting, etc., and then a reporter comes out and gets whatever we said wrong, <laughs> and uh, that's about all the advertising we do. So we need more numbers. Every person in this room. I would imagine can recruit one person for this school or the society here. I don't think you have to have a doctorate in Adlerian psychology. I don't think you have to write books, etc. I'm sure everybody knows somebody who thinks in psychological terms and invite them at least to come to a meeting like this. They don't have to sign up. Just come and see what we have to sell. Because, as you will learn in my later talk, therapy is a matter of selling. But you can't sell unless you got people who are at least contemplating buying, or at least who are willing to listen to a sales pitch. So, the first thing I ask you to do is recruit. 
I'm told that there are about 150 people sitting here or thereabouts. Do you know what that means? We would have 150 new members if you accepted this challenge. I'm sure you could do with new members. I'm sure you could do with whatever they could contribute, money-wise, work-wise, or whatever. <coughs> Secondly, and this is only for those of you who do professional work in Adlerian psychology, we have to stop talking in platitudes. I can give you a five minute sketch of what Adlerian psychology is all about because as I listen to old students in Chicago, this is about all they have left after they've spent years studying with us. You know why people do things? They do things because they have inferiority feelings. Apparently they wouldn't do them otherwise. And the goal of this is to change behavior from a minus to a plus. If a person has psychopathology, he is evading the life tasks. We don't have to know very much more about that just as long as we know that he's evading the life's tasks. The goal of psychotherapy is to promote social interest. Now, Bickhart and Ford have published a paper on just Adler's definitions of social interest, and there are so many of them that nobody really knows what social interest is. So people pick their own definition of social interest, including one that one of my Adlerian ga uh, colleagues gave me, and that is, social interest is whatever I say it is. <laughs> now, I've written a paper, I don't have social interest. I've been a therapist now for 70 years. I have never helped a patient develop social interest. I've helped people to become more caring. I know how to do that. I've helped people to become more cooperative, and I know how to do that. I've helped people to become more compassionate, and I know how to do that. I've helped people become more contributive, and I know how to do that. But I don't know how to promote social interest because I haven't the faintest idea what social interest is. Except that it's something positive and it's positive because Adler said so. <laughs> and this unfortunately is a response I get from students. They've never thought about whatever it is we're happen happening to talk about. They merely believe it because Adler said so, Dreger said so, and even sometimes Mosaic said so. So, we have to stop talking in platitudes. <coughs> and uh, people who do child guidance work in Adlerian psychology are equally guilty. We're not interested in normal kids. In fact, this may startle some of you, but according to Adler, there are no normal kids. Adler writes in a paper, normal children, if there be any. So consequently, since there are no, no normal kids, we don't have to apply ourselves to studying normal children how they develop, and how we can assist them in fulfilling themselves. We devote ourselves to the psychopathology of children. And there again, we talk in platitudes. There are four goals of misbehavior. And given these four goals, you use logical consequences, natural cons con consequences, and 
you sell enthusiasm. Of course, if you ask how would you uh, encourage this child, that one they don't have an answer for, but they know that you ought to really encourage not only children, but everybody. And we do not teach technique. We teach if the child does this, then you use this. And if the child does that, you use that. That's the way Dreykers' books read. And this is the one element of child guidance that I cannot go along with much versus as much respect as I have for the things that Dreykers taught me. Because if you do that kind of thing, you violate the Adlerian basic assumption of subjectivity. If you read Dreykers' books, it doesn't matter who the child is. If he misbehaves this way, the parent or the teacher does this. And consequently, we do child guidance, and many times we don't bring the child in. Because we feel erroneously that if you educate parents about what to do about children, so you have parent study groups, they will know exactly what to do when their child misbehaves. But they won't be told you know, spend some time reading a bedtime story to your child. Not because he's disturbed and not because he's not disturbed, but merely because children like to have a bedtime story before bed. We do not have a developmental psychology. And unfortunately, we have no interest in having a developmental psychology. Now, I first became aware of this in a co-counseling session that I participated in with Dr. Dreikers in a child guidance session in Chicago. Dreikers asked the mother about a, uh, the child's day. You know, does he get up by himself and does he dress himself and all of that kind of thing. And this woman who was being counseled the child was not there, said uh, that her child, her daughter, gets dressed by herself. But I button up her, uh, the back of her dresses. And Dreikers really went on, on a tirade. You're making yourself a slave for your daughter. She'll grow up this way and that way. Now, all pathologically, of course. And the mothers looked at him aghast. They said, little girls can't reach behind and do it. Oh, he was not aware of this. Because we do not have a child psychology. We have a child guidance program. So we don't know what kids do at what ages and how they think and how they feel and how they manage and all the so-called normal things that kids do in growing up. We know that if a child lies, it is this goal, and you do this, and if a child steals, he has this goal, and he, you do that. And if he talks in class, well, he has this goal, and you do that. And uh, it becomes tough on listeners, on students, when stuff like stealing can be put in all four groups. Now, Dreikers does not list it in all four groups, but some kids steal for attention. <clears throat> they don't want the object necessarily that they steal. They just want to know it. So when I was a youngster, Valentine's Day was different than it is today. It was the Depression, and nobody had enough money to buy Valentine's for the whole class and one for the teacher. You bought one Valentine for the kid in class that you liked most or best or whatever, and you passed him around in a mailbox, so-called, and that was it. One of uh, 
my fellow students, bragged that he stole enough Valentines from the five and ten cent store so that he could give one to every student in the class. And all he wanted to do was have a big name, that was all. He could do something that other kids could not, would not do. But some children steal because it is a go-to behavior. Let me see you try to stop me. They're reminiscent of James Cagney, you know. Okay, copper. There's no pen that can hold me in its grip. And they want to demonstrate that they're more powerful than the adults around. Some want to take revenge. I asked a kid who was in the juvenile detention home for the umpteenth time, why do you really steal? And he told me, my parents are divorced. I never see my father. There's only one time I get to see my father. When I get into trouble like this, he comes and gets me out of jail. You see, it was basically a revenge kind of thing. And then there are those kids who steal because they want to demonstrate that they're weak and helpless and that kind of thing. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. And anyway, they thought they could get away with it, but they find out that they're not smart enough to get away with it. And they're goal four people. So even if you know the four goals, it's pretty difficult to place behavior very, very neatly into this goal or this goal or this goal or this goal. And consequently, it's even more difficult to do anything about remediating the situation. But in addition to that, we have a problem with populations. The population that Dreikers and Adler worked with is not the population of children and parents today. I had an amusing encounter in Tel Aviv. One of my students who had studied with us from Tel Aviv for about three, three and a half years had gone back to Tel Aviv. And now Ada and I were making a tour of Tel Aviv. And he came over one evening and he said, Harold, I'm doing child guidance on Monday night at this and this school, etc. It's just around the corner. Why don't you come? And I said, Ahi, I do this 50 weeks a year. I'm on vacation. Well, he sort of was disappointed that I wouldn't come. And afterwards, Ada scolded me. He wants to show you that you taught him something in Chicago, and you're not letting him compliment you. So on Monday night, we walked over to the school, and we sat down in the back. Now, for those of, how many of you do child guidance? Well, then you may have had the same problem that I do. And that is, the first question you'll get asked by parents generally is, what, if you do, what do you do as a counselor if your child will only eat peanut and jelly sandwiches? So, Ada and I sat in the back, and I sent the translator back for us to feel our way in the discussion. And suddenly I heard, since I understood Hebrew, and now my esteemed teacher from Chicago, Dr. Mozak, will cancel, counsel the next family. <laughs> <laughs> the audience parted like the Red Sea. <laughs> And I walked up and I wondered, do Israeli parents have the same problems that Americans do? Do I know enough to counsel these people? So I went up and I asked her in Hebrew what her problem was, why she came to the... She said, Dr. Mozak, my child will only eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> 
I got a call from the FBI. One of my patients, 15 years old, but looking quite adult, dressed up in her mother's clothes, went and cleaned out a trust fund at the bank, or at least attempted to, and the FBI caught her. Drankers doesn't speak about people like that and kids like that, but more and more we're having major problems with children, which children's challenge and the challenge of parenthood don't attend to. So, in that sense, Adler was great for his time, Drinkers was great for his time, but we have to update it there in child psychology so that it meets the needs of parents and children right now. Speaking of populations, there are a good number of other kinds of populations, not only in the child field, that we don't deal with. First of all, there are different kinds of families. Drikers' families, Adler's families, deal with two parents and usually two or three kids. Now you've got foster families. You have single parent families. You have parents who live together in the same house but are not married to each other and the kids don't know what the heck to do about them and the parents don't know what to do about them or know what to do about them but they're at odds with each other in doing whatever it is they're doing. In psychopathology, well, Schulman wrote on schizophrenia, Pevin wrote on the bipolar person. Uh, I wrote on depression. Somebody else wrote on depression in a book and said, I got this all from my notes in Dr. Mozak's class, so I guess I wrote another chapter on depression, even if I didn't do it by hand. But other than that, I can't remember seeing a paper on hysteria. I can't remember seeing a paper on the phobias. I can't remember seeing a paper on any of the more exotic, but not rare, psychoses. <coughs> and perhaps that is partially due to our few numbers. We don't have any psychiatrists in NASAP. Oh, we have a couple. One is in my <coughs> practice, and one, Dr. Schulman, I was in practice with him for uh, 25 years. But other than that, we don't know any people who write that. So we're not tackling all the kinds of people that come for us. The people whom we do write about are because we happen to be clinicians. And we see schizophrenics and we do see bipolar people. So if we have some time, we write a paper or maybe even a book on them. But other than that, most people in Edlerian psychology are either counselors or teachers, and they do not have access to certain kinds of populations that clinicians have. And uh, I reiterate, we need more people work. Next. We have to teach psychotherapy. Now, I know you'll say, but of course there are therapy classes of your school and my school and that kind of thing. We don't teach what in other contexts are called 
on the street level psychotherapy. And much of the stuff that we teach is platitude. Much of the stuff that we teach is nonsense. So, I'm sure that many of you have been taught because they all got it from Dreikers, and of course if Dreikers said so, it must be so, that there are four stages of psychotherapy and those who've been paying attention to their teachers even know what the four stages of psychotherapy are. But unfortunately, there are not four stages of psychotherapy. Stages imply consecutive. So stage, there first of all there's stage one, and then it's followed by stage two, and then when you're finished with stage two, you go to stage three, and you wind up with stage four. Anybody who's done psychotherapy knows that that's utter nonsense. Now, Dreikers was German, and he can be forgiven. <laughs> he used the word stages, and if he had really known what, they, what it meant, he wouldn't have used the word. The rest of what he said might be well received, but he wouldn't have used the word. But Americans know what stages imply. And you don't use stages, and there are not four stages, there are four processes. <clears throat> and the first one, making contact with your patient, runs from the, well, before the first moment of psychotherapy until well after psychotherapy is done. I've often said, and I, I entered psychotherapy, I think, in 1946 or 1947 as part of required work at the time. And it was successful therapy in terms of the times it was done. And I've often said, I carry my therapist around in my back pocket. Now, I've been out of therapy for 60 years. But at crucial moments, when it counts, my therapist is right with me. So making contact relationship, so-called, is not stage one. It is a process that starts before therapy, and if it ever ends, it ends. I'll give you one example. I was a graduate student when I underwent therapy. I uh, was writing my dissertation and I did a before and after study of psychotherapy. It was rather the dumb of me because I had to wait till students finished their, until uh, patients finished their therapy. <laughs> and it looked like some of the patients were never gonna finish therapy <laughs> and I was never gonna get a degree. <laughs> So I mentioned this, I talked with my therapist about this, and he smiled at me and he said, Harold, he who is impatient remains a patient. <laughs> and every time my plane is late or something like that, and other people are fidgeting and I'm tempted to fidget, I hear his voice very, very clearly saying to me, Harold, he who is impatient remains a patient, and I relax. The plane will come when it comes. My worrying about it is not going to happen. So, these are not stages. They're processes. And I've given courses on each process. clear up this notion that there aren't stages.
Next, there's resistance. And if you're a student of Trikers, all you need to know is one sentence. You don't have to know what to do about it. You don't have to know why it occurs. According to the attribution to Trikers, resistance is when already grammatically it's wrong resistance is when the goals of the therapist and the goals of the patient are not aligned and I can't quarrel with that but that's not all there is to resistance because there is resistance which comes from the lifestyle there are people whom I call againers you name it and they're against it and there are people who are just against it right now, not because their lifestyle says so, but right now the therapist is trying to get across some, something that the patient does not really want to hear. And I've even had patients who resist by putting their hands over their ears so that they can tune me out and they will not hear. And of course, not a word is said in any of these books which quote Dreikers, etc. Not a word is said about, so what do you do? So, one thing that usually comes up because it places stress on at least novice therapists is, what do you do when your patient is mute? How do you do therapy when he won't talk to you? <coughs> and one of the first patients I ever saw in my whole career in 1947 was a catatonic schizophrenic and he had been mute for months hadn't said a word and unfortunately at that time at the university I was being taught Rotarian psychotherapy so I could not initiate conversation I could not advise I could not interpret I could not question I could only as Rogers taught us reflect feeling but of course <laughs> since he wasn't talking about any of his feelings I had a problem with that so twice a week I brought him down to my office we sat and we looked at each other for 50 minutes <laughs> I looked at him he looked at the floor and then I took him by the arm and took him back to the ward and finally after months of this and remember I knew about this time that he who is patient impatient remains a patient it tempered some of my impatience he started to talk with me and I asked him after all these months in the hospital I'm glad you started to talk but I'd like to know why did you start to talk and why didn't you talk all those months that you were silent he said well doctor you know how it is when you come to a new place you don't want to force yourself on anybody. <laughs> but you don't have to go to schizophrenia. One of my colleagues caught me as I was going home and said, Harold, I got a kid in there who ain't talking. His parents brought him here. Let his parents talk. He ain't talking. And nobody's going to make him. So he tried the therapist tried this and this and this and this and all good methods but they didn't work but I'm a member of an informal school called crazy therapists <laughs> I'm willing to do outrageous things the leader of the crazy therapist group uh, wrote a book and he tells one thing he tried he couldn't get his patient to see something that he wanted her to see so at this particular interview she entered the room and there was nobody there and she said doctor so and so and she heard a voice saying here and she looked around and said, where he said right here i can't see you 
Well, if you looked under the desk, you would see me. So she looked under the desk, and lo and behold, he was sitting there on the floor under the desk. <laughs> Dr. So-and-so, what are you doing down there? Well, you always put me down anyway, so I thought I'd give you a head start today. <laughs> now, it takes a gutsy therapist to do some of these things. And uh, I took off my coat, and I didn't know exactly what to do. But one thing I knew, I wanted to get home. It was getting late. So I walked into the room stuck out my hand to see whether he'd take it. He did. I kind of said, okay, now that we've done that, tell me how crazy your parents are. And he started to talk. <laughs> because everybody was working on the tack of him being, quote, crazy. So he got a chance to tell me what his parents were doing. And I said, you know, Dr. So-and-so is willing to tackle that subject with you, etc. You don't need me. Tell them how crazy your parents are. Um, it worked. So, uh, sometimes a conventional tactic will work, but a therapist must always be created <coughs> and be prepared to ad-lib. I have used many a technique one time. I've never used it before. I've never used it afterwards. But at the time I used it, it was the technique to use. So uh, let me stop here for just one second and ask you a question. Uh, would you like me to leave time for a question, period, or? Shall I just throw it on until the bitter end? <laughs> well, let's not waste any time. How many of you would like a question and answer period? Yes. Yes. Okay, enough. So I'll know when to stop and leave time for, for that. Next, we don't know anything about transference, although you will know something in the next journal issue because one of my students and I wrote a paper on transference in Adlerian terms. Now, most Adlerians do not know that transference exists. It exists for Freudians, but it doesn't exist for Adlerians. <laughs> to those who understand the concept of transference from Adlerian <laughs> terms, transference, to quote Dr. Schulman, who does it in the name of Alfred Adler, is a snare and a delusion. Now, how it is a snare and why it is a delusion, nobody but Dr. Schulman knows. It will help you pass an exam at our school, but it'll do little else if you're doing on-the-ground therapy. So, at the moment, since I'm still a young man, I'm writing a paper on I wrote a paper on transference, and I'm writing a paper on resistance, so you will not quote the one sentence of Dreykers's or the one sentence of Schulman or the one sentence of anybody else. But you will have a hands-on notion of what it is and what you do about it. So we need an expanded psychotherapy. And of course, we do psychotherapy, again coming back to the population thing, with new populations. When I was being trained in psychopathology, there was no DSM. You made up your diagnoses as you went along. And uh, diagnoses uh, didn't uh, always agree. So I sat into a a staff meeting in Denver in 1950 where a psychiatrist seeing a patient diagnosed the patient as paranoid schizophrenic and another psychiatrist quarreled with him on no he could not be a 
paranoid schizophrenic because you can't become paranoid schizophrenic at 19. So for the whole two hours, the battle went on. Could you or couldn't you be paranoid? Meanwhile, the patient is sitting paranoid as hell, making all kinds of people uncomfortable, costing the government, this was the VA, costing the government tons of money because they had to feed them and clothe them and treat them and all kinds of other things, which you as taxpayers paid for. And uh, we don't tackle populations like this, there are new populations. I was not given one lecture. In fact, there was no literature on eating disorders in my time. There was only one paper, and coincidentally enough, it was written by a British Adlerian on anorexia nervosa. And I would not be surprised if your library here has the individual psychology medical pamphlets which were issued in London uh, in the 1930s. <clears throat> I became a therapist without knowing anything about substance abuse, nothing. There were almost no drug users in the United States. Some musicians, Gene Krupa, whom some of the older people remember, a drummer, went to jail because they caught him smoking pot. There was only one treatment center in the whole United States, and that was the U.S. Public Health Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. And if you wanted or were mandated for treatment, that was where you got it. There was no place else. And since I wasn't going to see too many substance abuse people at that time, my university didn't bother to teach me anything. So later in my career, I had to learn about substances, about substance abuse, and even when I learned there were new substances and new people using them and that kind of thing. There are people who have Munchausen's disease. Now, unless you're working in an emergency room, you probably won't see them. But nevertheless, sometimes you never expect to see them. But they drop in on you. Let me give you an example. In 1956, I took my specialty board examinations in psychology. In order to sit for the exam, you had to have five years of postdoctoral supervised practice. So I decided to sit for the exam and become a so-called specialist. And I decided I wasn't going to study for the exams. I felt that what they had taught me at the university and five years of experience, I didn't have to pass with a hundred or an A. All I had to do was pass. And I thought I could get a grade of 76 even without studying. The night before the exam, I got a case of the willies. I felt Anything they ask me about hysteria, the obsessive compulsive disorders, schizophrenia, I could probably answer. And as I said, not greatly necessarily, but all I needed was a 76. But what if they asked me about some of the neurological disorders? Well, I had spent a year on a neurology ward, so I knew about the common stuff. I knew about the various forms of epilepsy and about stroke and that kind of thing. But there were some things that I had studied at the university, but I didn't know very much about. So I decided to take out my neurology book and take a peek at what the book said about some of those disorders. But I wasn't going to spend too much time on it because the psychological stuff I knew I could pass. So I came to a condition called Alzheimer's disease. 
Mind you, here is what it says. Alzheimer's disease is a rare neurological disease. Only 25 cases have been reported in the entire medical literature, to which most of you probably can say, ha, 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 right now. There are probably more than that diagnosed on any particular day in the United States. So I looked over what it said about Alzheimer's disease. It had a paragraph about that big, read it quickly, decided not to think about it, just to remember, and went on to the next paragraph, Pick's disease. Pick's disease is even more rare than Alzheimer's disease, meaning that there were fewer than 25 in all the United States in the medical literature. So I didn't even look at it. And the next day I went in to take the exam. I opened up the test booklet and guess what the first question was? <clears throat> Describe pig's disease. <laughs> now with all the things that I was going to see and use in my career, they had to pick the one thing that nobody else saw and I wouldn't see either. I was furious. But nevertheless, I knew something about whatever and I passed. So for the last 55 years, I've been a specialist. Some months later, Dreiker knocked on my door at the office and said, Harold, I'd like you to come in and see one of my patients. So I went in and there was a woman in her 50s. And uh, she wasn't all there. And she used obscenities. Every third word was not an obscenity. And uh, I looked at Dreikers, uh, what do you want me to do? And he said, talk to her for a while. I said, about what? He said, anything. So I talked with her and got a read on her diagnostically. And I said, she does not have a psychosis. She is not schizophrenic. And Dreiger said, I agree with you, but what is she? And I said, I haven't the faintest idea, but I'll bet she has some neurological disorder. So we made an appointment for her with the neurologist across the hall, and he called us back a couple of weeks later. Thank you so much for sending Mrs. So-and-so. It's the first case I've ever seen of pig's disease in my entire career. <laughs> So, populations that we study change, and we have to catch up with it. We can't leave it all to mainstream psychology, because mainstream psychology deals in presentation. And obsessive-compulsive has this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom. So-and-so uh, personality disorder has this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. And that's all they know. But they don't know why, except in terms of causes. And the causes these days are psychopharmacological, mostly. But they don't know why the person has chosen his particular symptomatology and even more unless they do medication they don't know what to do about it and if psychology psychopathology is merely a matter of you got this symptom this symptom this symptom you won't know what to do about it because Hitlerians do not talk descriptively about anything. They talk in terms of the law of movement. People do this in order to accomplish some aim or some goal. And if you know the goal, well, you might figure out a better way to retain the goal and figure out a better way of getting there. This is all some people need. 
or you may find out that the goal is really a lousy goal and address the elimination of that goal if you can. I say if you can because in addition to the goals of the therapists and the uh, patient not being in alignment, not being congruent, uh, people just won't let go of their lifestyles easily. They have faith. They will treat it as if it is ultimate truth. And that's what I'm going to be talking about later this evening, or at least one of the things I will be talking about. <coughs> so, I would only suggest a start if you're going to do this kind of work in psychopathology because in another year or two they're coming out with DSM-5 and they're going to have a bunch of new names and new entities and that kind of thing and eliminate some of the old names and old entities uh, as if they uh, no longer exist and things which were diseases will now be symptoms and things which were symptoms will now be diseases and all kinds of things that uh, psychologists and psychiatrists do as busy work. Uh, because <clears throat> housewives know something that psychiatrists and psychologists act as if they don't know. When they describe in DSMs some entity, they have this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, and all are exactly the same. They all got the same symptoms. Well, if a housewife goes to the local, I don't know what you call them here, supermarket, <coughs> she doesn't shop that way. She knows that one brand has this, and another one has more, and another one is sweeter, and another one is this, etc. And almost no two cans of peaches are alike. If they were all alike, there'd be only one need for one brand. And this is true of schizophrenia and hysterics. They <coughs> ain't all alike. We call it the uniqueness of personality. And we have to remember that when we create our own psychopathology. So even if 90% of schizophrenics do this, there's still 10% that one of them might be your patient who don't do this, whatever this may be. So we have to attend <coughs> to different psychopathologies there. Next, we have to do more research. Now, and this is no put down, teachers and counselors are generally not taught research methods. Psychologists are taught research methods, but in this electronic age, they don't use them. My students who write dissertations, and this is probably true at any university in the United States, get a statistician who puts all the data into the machine and out comes an answer. And the student doesn't even know what the answer is. He just knows he has figures. And he knows that professors love figures. So, and of course, psychiatrists, except for those who are in research psychiatry, don't do any research either. Now, we have a claim to not doing research. It's not a claim I'm proud of, but we have a claim. Hitlerian psychology started in German-speaking countries, initially in Vienna, in Austria. But European psychologists and psychiatrists 
abhorred research. In our journal, occasionally we find a research article or two, but in German and Lyrian journals, you will not find any research at all. And in our states, perhaps the leading people who do research are the people at Georgia University in Atlanta, uh, Ray Kern and his group. But other than that, we make many statements and we use them in therapy and we are not sure that it is exactly so. So, one is from my point of view, again, a bit of nonsense, but it's universal among Edlerians. I first encountered it when I went to a party, an Edlerian party, in about 1951. And it was an apartment building the Adlerians lived on the third floor. So we went up the stairs and there was a person standing on the landing whom I had never met before. And he stuck out his hand and he said, I'm John Smith, I'm a middle child. <laughs> now, of course, if you know he's a middle child, you know everything there is to know. <laughs> Birth order as usually written about in the Adlerian uh, literature, violates the Adlerian assumptions. We like to say that the oldest is conservative, the middle child is rebellious, and the youngest child stands on his tippy toes to look over the heads of his older siblings. If you know that, and the oldest child is, uh, the only child is neurotic. If you know that, you know everything Adlerians say that you need to know about Adlerian psychology. Well, that violates the basic assumption of Adlerian psychology, again, of subjectivity. It says we don't care how you see it. If you were born first, you're going to be this, and if you were born second, you're going to be that. And it is a, quote, scientific form of astrology. <laughs> if you are born under this position rather than under this star or this planet, then you're going to be this way, etc. Now, from a non Adlerian stance, even, it doesn't make any sense. You mean it's the same for boys and girls? Gender doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is if you're first, second, or third. It doesn't make any difference what your, what your ethnicity. So a Chinese firstborn is like an American firstborn? That ain't so. Independent of Adlerian psychology, the only significant factor, if you think the way Adlerians think, is the position you're born in. Nothing else counts. So, Schulman and I, some years ago, wrote a paper and on birth order. It goes like this, the first paragraph. Then there's a line, a vertical line, down the central part of the page. And on the left it says, Dr. Schulman's position, Dr. Mosak's position. And then we go on after that with both of us saying the same thing. And Adlerians who do not practice that way still write that way. I'm sure that Adler did not practice that way, even though he made many such statements that the oldest is this and the youngest is that, etc., etc. And some of us are working on bettering the explanation of birth order based on a subjective approach. It depends on how the person sees the particular position he's born in. Otherwise, you have to create all kinds of dodges. I know he's not like a second child, but he's a second child who is uh, acting like a first child. 
Well, if he's a second child acting like a first child, why not call him psychologically a first child, even if he's chronologically a second child? So we have to do much more by way of research. And here, I'm as guilty as anybody, with exception of one thing, and that is I think about it. But what do I have to go on? I have to go on what my patients tell me about how they see it, how they grew up, and that kind of thing. But I haven't seen all kinds of patients. I've seen a hell of a lot of them, but not all there are. Or I can rely on Adler, but I can't rely on his writing, unfortunately. I can rely on Dreikers, but I can't rely on his writing. But the understanding that I saw of Dreikers doing birth order with patients really convinced me that in writing we got it all wrong. I have not seen any Adlerian writer write on the subjectivity of birth order. It's all an objective approach. The oldest child is, and the youngest child is, etc. And unfortunately, this scoots out into the general population because we had a news program in Chicago and uh, they had a thing uh, once a week or twice a week. Viewers could write in a question on anything and they'd get some expert in town to uh, comment on it. So some lady wrote into the TV station and asked, I have heard that all only children are neurotic and it's not wise to have an only child. Would you please answer that? So they called the Psychological Association in Chicago. What psychologist knows about birth order, etc.? And they gave the station my name. And for about 15 minutes, and I still have the tape, they sent me the tape. The questioner from the station keeps trying to get me to say that only children are neurotic. Maybe he had one or was one, I don't know. But at any rate, uh, yeah, I know that only children uh, have uh, the possibility of growing up as normal as anybody else. But are you trying to tell me, Dr. Rozak, that most are not neurotic? And I say, yeah. And I say, yeah. And I say, yeah, again. He doesn't hear me. He keeps phrasing the same question. And of course, the general population, they don't know about these things. They worry about these things. And if they can seek information, they can seek information from people like you and me. And unfortunately, the answers we give them is the oldest is conservative, the second is a rebel, the third is sad, and that kind of baloney. So we need all kinds of research. And some of the research, as I said in a different context before, is simple. Some of the research only consists of counting a frequency count. Some requires very, very primitive mathematical research. I presume every one of you at some time in your growth, perhaps even in elementary school, was taught how to do an average. It might even be uh, do you good to relearn it. And if you contribute something useful, all the better. But do you know what kind of research we do a lot of? 
<clears throat> my students at my school do a lot of this kind of research, and they get much of it from the reading. The early recollections of dentists, the early recollections of cosmeticians, the early recollections of psychologists, the early sa of salesmen, the early recollections of etc., etc. And for much of it, who cares? <laughs> I can't think of one reason beyond having somebody get a degree reading a paper on the early recollections of cosmeticians. So, I want to counsel you. Think in terms of research. There are research questions that only, only consist of researching other people's research. We have some meta-studies where people take a topic and find out what every article on that topic has concluded. And at least we have some idea of consensus. And it may be difficult in the sense it takes time, but it's not difficult in terms of doing research. Next, we have to link our psychology to other links. Because if all you know is psychology, you don't know enough to be a psychologist. Because all kinds of things come up which are not centrally psychological. If you're doing psychological custody work, how can you do it without a knowledge of the laws of your particular city and state? You can't. Because even if you have a good idea, it may be prohibited in your particular area. So you have to have links to law, to literature. Uh, about the only two things I remember seeing are an article on the book of Job in our journal, a very nice one, and an article on Holden Caulfield. But other than that, I don't remember too many links to literature. You have to know about religion or spirituality, because if not, you may do a lousy job. Let me tell you a lousy job I did. I was invited by one of my Adlerian friends to Salt Lake City to do a demonstration of Adlerian couples counseling. Now, I've done that a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. I'm not concerned uh, about that. Uh, you don't have to study up on it. You just have to listen to the people, understand what they're saying and where it's going, what their goals are, and that kind of thing. Well, I went out to Salt Lake City, which is about 98% Mormon. And we don't have too many Mormons in Chicago. Here and there I get one as a patient or as a student. I learned something from them, but I don't see too many Mormons. So I did not know very much about Mormon uh, <coughs> practice. And uh, they gave me a couple to work with. And this couple had 14 children. <coughs> that already requires you to know something about the Bible. Because Mormons adhere to the first commandment in the Bible. Anybody know what it is? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. 
so they don't use contraception except when they do and uh, this particular uh, well that's true of any religion and uh, they had 14 kids I used a technique which I developed. I developed it initially for individuals who are defeated, discouraged, have negative thoughts about themselves, flagellate themselves, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and I asked them as individuals, tell me 10 nice, positive things about yourself. Oh, I can't. Well. I'm sure you never got to this age by doing only positive, negative things. So somewhere in your career, you've done something positive or you were positive or nice or constructive. Let me hear about it. And I hold up my fingers ready to count. And if they don't give anything, I wait. That puts pressure on them. That's one thing you do about silence. So funny to say, well, if I had to come up with a trait, I'd say, and they come up with one trait. And I sit and I wait, or sometimes I say, okay, that's nice, you got one, go ahead. And they come up with, gee, that's hard, I can't come up with more. <coughs> this will take forever. Well, I got forever time. I can't do this. I say, I think you can. And showing that kind of confidence in you, I'm going to wait until you go, well, all right, I got this and I got that, I got that. And they come up with two or three more and they wait, etc. I say, yeah, you, I bet you wouldn't have this difficulty if I'd asked you to talk about your 10 worst traits or deeds. And they come up with a hard to suppress smile and finally <coughs> however it is we do it we come up with 10 and they say thank God that's over mm -hmm. and I tell them you're not off the hook yet mm -hmm. oh I want you when you leave here to stop at a novelty store a dime store or someplace where you can pick a this kind of thing up and get yourself a small calendar and every day I would like you to write one nice positive thing about yourself and I will collect the homework so when you come in next week I will expect you to have six or seven or eight depending on the day positive things about you and they say okay if you want me to do it I'll do it and I stop them at mid flight and I say to them wait a minute before you agree I have to tell you that I can't accept your consent since what I'm asking you to do is a dangerous experiment <laughs> It requires informed consent. This means I got to tell you the dangers of doing this, and then you can tell me whether you will or won't do it. And now they're really intrigued. What's so dangerous about writing something down in your in a little counter? And sometimes they ask, and I tell them, one year from today, how many entries will you have? And depending on the year, they will say 365 or 366. And I say, one year from today, with 365 positive entries in your calendar, how are you going to hang on to the notion that there's nothing good about you, you're a nerd, you're a jerk, or whatever term he uses in her to himself? And that helps to change him around. Because instead of pondering all the negative things about themselves, they have to at least one time a day ponder something positive about themselves. 
every day. Well, I thought of that uh, as a technique, and then I did it as a couple's technique. <coughs> Tell me ten things about him or her. Positive. So, you get a reading on where the marriage stands. They could not come up with a single positive thing about the other one. And now, Mozak's brain went into action. <laughs> Wrong, because I didn't know. I said, why do you stay together? Obviously, you can't even think of one positive thing about the other. We are married eternally. Yes, I know people get married to death do us part, but even those people who swear that oath, they get divorced, they get separated. <gasps> I hear that kind of gasp from the audience, and I know I'm in trouble, but I don't know what I'm in trouble with. And they said to me, we're eternally married. And I said, it's a big deal. <laughs> and finally, my friend, my Illyrian friend, Dr. Hugh Allred, stood up and said, obviously, Dr. Mosak, fine therapist that he is, does not know Mormon theology. <coughs> In Mormon theology, you do not get married till death do us part. You get married eternally. So if one of you dies, the other one, when he gets to heaven, will find you waiting for him, and you'll continue your marriage until the end of time. And here they couldn't, they couldn't get through today. So I decided I better learn something about Mormonism just in case a rare Mormon falls in, finds himself in my treatment plan. So you have to know something about at least some of the major religions. Uh, for example, I have men with a masculine protest, which means that they feel that it is terribly important, an article of faith, to be a man, however it is they define it. And we talk about something, and whatever we talk about is meaningful, and it moves the person to where his eyes become laden with tears, but he won't cry. And he says, don't worry, I'm not going to cry. And I said, What's, I say, what's so terrible about crying? <clears throat> and they say, well, it's not manly, it's weak. It's showing your weak feminine side or some such statement, etc. And I listen very carefully and then I say, do you know what the shortest statement, shortest sentence in the New Testament is? And most often they do not know. It's interesting that as a Jew I have to educate them. <laughs> and I say, Jesus wept. Isn't it terrible <coughs> that the founder of Christianity was so weak and not enough of a man? And then the tears flood out. Or one that probably, how many Catholics here? <coughs> I know this is Lutheran country. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> well, I'm not even sure that you will know. I got a nun as a patient at age 53. She had gone into the convent 40 years earlier when she was 13 years old. <coughs> knew very, very little about life and living and that kind of thing. And being a, an adolescent, she suddenly began having feelings 
which he knew were wrong by her definition because of where they occurred. They occurred between her legs. So they had a spiritual director at the convent and she could have consulted him and that kind of thing. But she was so ashamed and felt so guilty about having this feeling that she suppressed it, did not seek any help for it. And now 40 years later, it resulted in a problem that she could not avoid. So she went to the mother superior and told her the problem. For the 40 years, well, a bit less than 40 years, it was 40 years that I got her, maybe about 38 years or something like that, she had had, and she didn't know what to call it, but she was having multiple orgasm without doing anything about it, without stimulating herself in any way. And she prayed harder in the 40 years that this would stop, but it didn't stop. And then, at the time she sought help from the Mother Superior, it had taken a grievous turn. Every time she prayed, it led to orgasm. <coughs> now, what kind of nun was she if she stopped praying? <laughs> and she was a terribly guilty sinner if she prayed and it brought on orgasm. So they sent her to a so-called House of Affirmation, which is a treatment center for Catholic clergy somewhere on the East Coast. And she fell into the hands of a priest who was one of my students in Chicago. And he and a priest treated her. And she got the priest to, uh, I'm sorry, a priest and, a, and had a psychiatrist treating her. And uh, she got the priest who was my student because she was an obsessive compulsive. And whatever she did, she did without stop, etc. She felt compelled to do it. So they treated her for about two years. And when they told her, when she told them that she was a sinner and going straight to hell, they told her that she was not a sinner, she was an obsessive compulsive. So they tried treating her for being an obsessive compulsive and therefore not responsible for her sin. She said, but I know better than you. I know that a person who has feelings like this has to be a sinner and is going to hell. And she was deteriorating. So finally the priest said, there's somebody in Chicago who is not a Catholic, but is probably treated as more Catholic clergy than anybody in the world. Ask your mother superior to transfer you to Chicago. So she was transferred to Chicago. And she played the same dirty game with me. If she was a sinner, I could do some stuff and I'd get a priest to help. If she was an obsessive compulsive, I love working with obsessive compulsives. But she wouldn't let herself be nailed down to either. So when you talked about one, she decided she was the other. <coughs> so, getting nowhere with her, I invited a student a priest to co-counsel with me. He made an unfortunate error, but he was not at fault. He didn't come in in his blacks. He came in in slacks and a polo shirt, that kind of thing. And he tried to sell her on the notion of uh, general confession because she had complained, I don't remember all the sins I committed in the last 40 years. And she said it wouldn't be valid because she didn't remember. And what if there was one sin she didn't confess? She still would not be in a state of grace. She was still going to hell. And I let him wrestle with those issues. 
and she beat him at every punch. And finally the hour was over and he left, we thanked him, and she said, he's not a priest, is he? Because he had not come in blacks. So, I tried it again and didn't really get through to her in any way. But I had a good relationship with her because she knew that I was really caring and really trying my best to get her off the hook and keep her from going, you know, uh, go straight to hell, uh, don't stop and go, uh, don't collect $200. And getting nowhere, I invited another priest from a different order to come in and help me. This guy was in trouble with his bishop because he liked wearing sandals, purple velour shirts, beads, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and wouldn't wear his blacks except when he performed mass, said mass. So when I called him on the phone, I said, be sure to come in blacks. If you won't come in blacks, that's your privilege, but I will not be able to get done what I want to get done. I said, okay, I'll come in blacks. So he came in blacks, and he was nice and caring, and said, uh, she said, uh, she can't have a confession because it wouldn't be a specific confession. He said, sister, you don't have to have it. I'll accept a general confession. And she said, but what if I forget a sin? After all, I'm an obsessive compulsive. <laughs> You don't know, step on a crack, break your mother's back. <coughs> and they had a big go-round on this. And she said, if I had to even confess my sins that I remember, it would take a priest's whole professional career. So the hour ended, he left, and I felt, well, we tried. But then she said something interesting. If I could ever bring myself to go to confession, I would go to see Father Evan. Well, that at least was a step in the right direction, but she wasn't moving. And finally, we got to the week before Easter, and she had not performed her Easter duty in 40 years. She had not taken communion, and she had not gone to confession, and she was really going to hell. And I thought, gee, I'd love to help this poor soul. She is suffering so much. But apparently she wasn't going to let go of such a precious symptom. So. It was a very warm day, and I was tired, and we talked and talked, and I said, Sister, why don't you go to confession? You'll feel better, not because I want to. You'll take communion, you'll say your confession, and for the first time in 40 years, you'll be in a state of grace. And you know Father Evan is willing to accept a general confession couldn't sell her on it. And I thought, well, another year she's not going to be in a state of grace. And suddenly, one of those comic strip light bulbs lit up over my head, something I had not thought of in decades. I, say, I said to her, Sister, you can't go confession but how about an act of perfect contrition or contrition you're Jewish you're not supposed to know that <laughs> for those of you who don't know what an act of contrition or perfect contrition is it was devised when all of Europe was at war you know the hundred years war the thirty years war and uh, there were no priests to give people absolution before they died. So they started the act of contrition or perfect contrition. 
And in that, you merely make a statement, I'm sorry for all the sins that uh, I've performed, etc., etc., etc. And it's just a simple statement. And if you do it because you want to be reconciled with God, it is called an act of perfect contrition. But if you do it because you're afraid that God will stoke up the fires of hell for you if you don't do it, it's merely an act of contrition. But both are completely valid for civilians now. And in addition to being valid, they are equal to what is now called the sacrament of reconciliation, it used to be called the sacrament of confession. I said, if you do not perform an act of contrition, I will know that you are not afraid of going to hell, but you are deliberately attempting to gain admission. <laughs> she said, I'll call up Father Raven. She confessed a general confession. She took communion, and she was in a state of grace. Now, that didn't happen to me before, it didn't happen to me afterwards, but at that particular moment, if I didn't know about an act of contrition, I wouldn't, I'd still be wrestling with her today, perhaps. So, you have to have links to all kinds of, at least the common religions, where you're likely to see a patient who espouses those kinds of views. the things that comes up in the question period, which I'll take before the question period since I know it, <laughs> is, well, Dr. Mozak, we know that people like you and you and you and you can do all of these magnificent things, <coughs> but one, I'm not capable of doing that kind of stuff. I'm not trained to do it and that kind of thing. And in addition to that, uh, I don't have an outlet for doing it wherever it is I practice or whatever. It's not even an Adlerian clinic or hospital or prison or whatever. And I'm not suggesting all of you become Adlerian clinicians and become real, real pros at it. If you do decide that, it's, I can tell you it's a great ride. I've been on it for a long time and I enjoy. I don't have to work. I enjoy working every day. But even if you cannot write a paper or give a lecture or teach or whatever, you can donate a book or two to some Adlerian facility so that people who can do the things that you like seeing, to see being done can get done. You can lick envelopes. Somebody set up all these chairs here. You can do that, no matter what your training is. <coughs> there are all kinds of little itsy bitsy things that require doing, and you can help do it. So you can't claim exemption because I just don't happen to have a master's or a doctor's in psychology or counseling. 
That is a cop-out. Adler had a good word for it, a word I hate. It's cowardice. You're afraid to help your fellow man. And this is something that it, a few that Adlerians want to change. That you and your fellow man are one and the same. And just as they have a responsibility to you, you have a responsibility to them. That's not idle talk. It's not the kind of stuff you write at examinations. And I hope this doesn't fall on deaf ears because I've had the experience where it has. I was asked to speak on it when we inaugurated our new president, Dr. Crossman, half a dozen years. And they had the leader of the Italian Adlerians and a couple of Admir uh, American Adlerians speaking on where is Adlerian psychology going. And I did something, you know, the crazy therapist that I am. I handed out a pencil and a piece of paper to every attendant. And I said, write down one thing that you are prepared to do for Adlerian psychology in the next year. Not a whole bunch of things and not your uh, great work, et cetera, for your life. Just one simple thing you are willing to do for Adlerian psychology in the year. And people thought about it, wrote down something, and I collected them. And I held it up. I said, I don't know what here, what's here, but this is where Adlerian psychology is going in the next year. The president at the time of NASAM said, Magnificent, you've got to give me all those papers and I'll see to it that it gets done. I don't think we had one respondent. But that hurts. If you have responsibility, out of social interest or not, then put your money where your mouth is and don't listen or utter pious statements about, gee, that's what we really should do. Those are good intentions. And even if you didn't study religion, you've heard the statement that the road to hell is paved with them. Good intentions. And I gotta save, it's my responsibility, save you from going to hell. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, question time, or comment time. Dr. Bozak, what's your read on the current bad diagnosis oppositional defiance disorder, ODD? I'm going to avoid your question. <laughs> I'll answer it, but I'm going to avoid your question because one of DSMs. I don't use DSM. Yeah or nomenclature diagnosis anymore Malarkey. clinically. If I testify in court and the judge forces me, uh, what di diagnosis would you give this person? I have to come up with a dsm 4 our diagnosis. Yeah. Insurance companies will not reimburse you if you don't come up with a nomenclature diagnosis. So I know dsm 4 well enough so that I can perform that obligation. Clinically, I don't care whether your child is an op uh, oppositional uh, disorder or any other kind of disorder. What I'm concerned about is that it's a diagnosis that we never used in the past. One of my graduate students says when she sees that diagnosis, she just translates it into faulty parenting. It seems like it's a blame the child diagnosis. Well, all the diagnoses are blame the child diagnoses. If the child doesn't eat, sleep, uh, uh, has a Temper ten. Uh, ADHD. Uh, uh, it's always the child who's at fault. 
and I had to make a change in my thinking because when I was being taught, it was always the mother's fault. So we talked about the schizophrenogenic mother. It wasn't the child's fault. And I don't care about blame. You want my help? I don't care what your diagnosis is. I will try to help you if I am capable of helping you because you may need something other than what I have to offer. You may need a woman therapist, for example. You may need a younger therapist. You know, a therapist is one of the boys, sort of. So I don't use diagnoses clinically. And as far as blame is concerned, I don't use blame. I am a problem solver. I was a math major before I went wrong and adopted psychology. <laughs> and as so, the child has a problem. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. The parent has a problem. Let's see what we can do about it. Yeah. And I don't care what you call it. I never treat a diagnosis. I treat human beings. And that's why I say, I have to avoid your question. Nowhere in my records, except on insurance forms, will you find a diagnosis of any patient I'm working with. For me, tell me where it hurts and we'll see if we can alleviate it. I'll tell you where you hurt other people and we'll see if we can eliminate that. The first covers the neuroses and psychoses, and the second covers the personality disorders. Yes? Um, thank you for coming, Dr. Music. I appreciate all your wisdom. Um, Jane Fonda was interviewed by Pierce Bronson yesterday and said can that... Can you stand up oh, so okay. I can see you? Uh, Jane Fonda mentioned how greed is really taking over this country, and you mentioned about doing for others. and having just a simple thing that can be done. What is your, you know, kind of prognosis or bent on what's happening right now with the demonstrations and the one, you know, 99 percenters and where our country is going over your lifetime and in the future? Got a week? <laughs> I have time. <laughs> well. I'm no expert at politics, and I come from a state which is the most corrupt <laughs> state yes. in the Union. We just, this week, sentenced our second back-to-back -back governor <laughs> and four of our last eight governors have been or are in jail in prison so uh, I can't really uh, well you should be an expert then <laughs> you should be an expert then but obviously there's a lot of discontent in this country and it's not the Occupy Wall Street that is unique uh, generally they're a group of younger people and one thing I learned, because I was one of them, at 16 I was ready to save the world, and I knew how. <laughs> and anybody who didn't agree with me just was plain wrong. So uh, I encountered this growing up because uh, Just before and while I was a soldier, incidentally, I got part of my training, seven months of it, right here in Minneapolis in the Air Corps. Uh, there were the people who felt uh, America first. So forget what's happening in Europe and don't worry and let England solve its problems by itself 
and let's sort of put up an emotional wall along the east and west coast and uh, stay out of world affairs and <coughs> just keep our own counsel. And then, of course, in New Jersey, there was the Nazi Bund who were quite willing and did help Hitler, uh, etc., because uh, Hitler was on the march and that was the future. You know how I know it was the future. Do you know what the German slogan was? Gut unter uns, God's with us. Morgen das Welt, tomorrow the world. So it was only just a matter of time before Hitler would be the Chancellor of the United States as well as the rest of the world and uh, that kind of thing. So much of this kind of thinking has occurred before and to some extent it is useful. We had it in Vietnam War times, we had sit-ins and burning down the R uh, ROTC building and uh, all of that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it's your job to make it a better world. People, unfortunately, say the same thing I've been talking about in psychology. What can one person do? Or what can two people do? Or some such thing like that. So instead of doing what one person can do, they don't do anything. And it continues to exist. And people just, we elect governors who we know are going to jail. We know they're crooks, but we don't have any alternative, we say. So, we say we're voting for the least amount of crookedness. If you do that, you will, as the statement goes, get the government you deserve. What else? Gee, it's nice to know I've covered all the world's problems. <laughs> In only two hours. <clears throat> what would you like to be known as? I'm sorry? What would you like to have your legacy be known as for your life? what you've accomplished, what would you like people to know about you? What would you like people to know about you, your legacy? One is I heard my eulogies already. Uh, they dedicated the Harold and, Moza Harold and Bertie Mosaic Library uh, at our school two weeks ago and all kinds of people came up and made lovely speeches about me and not everybody gets an opportunity to hear that he's wonderful and all good etc and he's still around yet <laughs> did he leave anything out? <laughs> all my misdeeds <laughs> what would I like to people to know several things. In whatever I did, I was a teacher. As a clinician, I was a teacher. As a teacher, I was certainly a teacher. As a lecturer, I was a teacher. With my kids, my family, I was a teacher. And I don't mean I got up in each instance and stood at a podium or whatever and uh, <clears throat> gave lessons. But I always wanted to let people know that there are things you can learn and things you can better about the world and about yourself. And, you know, 
you may not be able to do anything about the Occupy Wall Street crowd or the uh, uh, Tea Party crowd or whatever, but one thing you can do is vote. And you can do that intelligently. And if you got guts, you can even run for office. Except in Chicago, where you might wind up dead. <laughs> well, we've had a career. We've had that happen, too. Secondly, outside of being a teacher, it feels almost like bragging. I'd like them to know that I cared in small ways and in large ways. And it's nice to come back here where, as you heard Alan say, I helped found this place 40 years ago and have old students come up and hug me and tell me what their lives are like now and how I perhaps was helpful to them and that kind of thing. And if they know those two things, Except for facts, they know all they have to know about me. Thank you. What else? I'm giving you a last chance. I'm 90. <laughs> You don't come up with questions today, you may never get a chance. Would you please come forward? I can't see you and hear you from that spot. Is this a little better? Okay, better. All right, that's too close to the front. I read a paper that you wrote with Rikers on the fifth task of spirituality. And I know you're going to be talking about this later tonight, but there's a part that you guys wrote about when you talked about different ways of searching for spirituality, whether it's through atheism or organized religion or the essence of living. So my question is now that we're in a true postmodern time, has your answer to how people seek out spirituality changed? And the methods are still valid. The techniques, there are better techniques I've devised since that paper was written in the 1960s, I, re I recall. And if you're interested in an update from there, I've written, after Dragers' death, a paper on religious illusions and psychotherapy. Religious illusions and psychotherapy. And you'll see some of the techniques I've devised in the last 20, 30, 40 years that I didn't know. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, that kind of view later this evening. But I'll tell you, you're going to find it strange because the faith, hope, and love that I'm going to talk about has nothing specifically to do with religion. But it comes from religion. Uh, somebody else had a hand up. Jill. What would be a special message you'd like to leave us all with today that we can carry through and know that we've heard from you, our dear teacher? I'm going to give away that. I'm sorry you're not going to be here this evening, but I'm going to answer that in my talk this evening. Well, I'll listen to the tape. Well, I can come up with the usual nonsense. I love you all. <laughs> I don't know you, but I love you. And we love you. Somebody back there had a hand up before and I couldn't. There were two people raising hands. Okay, take advantage of your chance, I said. 
you know, we're uh, trying to plot a course for the school <coughs> and trying to become more <coughs> embedded in the community. And there are a lot of things you've said today that inspire me. I'm wondering if you might have some advice for the school as we try to exert our influence. Well, Dan, that's hard for me to answer because I don't know your mission. We're trying to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> you should have asked you know me. You know what our vision is? It's transforming society through social interest in action. Okay. If uh, you ask that question, uh, that's not my baby. I'm the only Adlerian in the world, I suspect, who doesn't know a damn thing about social interest. So I don't know how to promote social interest in the world. If you ask me how to promote some other things in the world, that I can answer. Well, let me put it another way then. If you had some advice for an organization that was humbly trying to have a positive influence on the community, what would that advice be? I'd go to the prophets, especially Jeremiah. I didn't give you a game plan for that. About feeding the hungry and helping the ill and all of that kind of stuff. If that's your mission. But outside of psychology, that's my mission. I don't do that through my school. Except occasionally we have a drive to collect cans of food around Thanksgiving or something like that. But other than that, that's not our mission. It's something we incidentally do. Not only that, uh, uh, where's Dave Matthew? Oh, he's gone. Well, I can't ask him. We have people in Chicago who live under the bridge. We have homeless. Wow. We have bridges across the river, and there are two levels. The bottom one is used mainly for trucks, and the top one is used for cars. And since it's warmer, the lower you get, many of the homeless uh, pitch cardboard boxes and tents and that kind of thing down there and endure the cold weather. And our school, our, the student body, goes down there nightly with blankets, with food, with uh, <coughs> that kind of stuff. Or take them to shelters if they're willing to go. But that's not part of our mission, our school mission. This is something students out of quote social interest yeah, you do know. <laughs> I put quotes around it oh. <laughs> out of quote so social interest unquote do because they see social interest as that um, you do well by the disadvantage but that's not part of the school mission. Yes? How has your understanding of Adlerian psychology changed with age? Because I know at different life stages I see things differently. Can you well, obviously, as I've grown older, I've been exposed to a world that has changed. Uh, and uh, I've had to adjust to the world, not passively adjust to the changing world. And uh, I pay attention. I try to stay with the world and 
see what it's doing and where it's going and what people are doing. In fact, if my plane is late at the airport, I don't get impatient. I don't do, do, dare do that after my therapy. But uh, I'll sit and I'll watch what people do at the airport. It's interesting the things, the kind, the kinds of things you learn. But I've become more of a questioner. You know, when Drager said this is so, I said, yeah. But later, I was able to say sometimes it's that way. And at other times, as you heard me say this afternoon, I say it's not so, or it's not so anymore. At one time, it was so. So, but I've always had people who attempted and sometimes even succeeded to set me straight on things. My colleagues or some, my family or another, have invited me to see something through their eyes rather than my eyes. Because my eyes, like your eyes or anybody's eyes, are tricky. We see things that are not necessarily out there, but are up there. Yes? One last thing, Doctor. I'm sorry to monopolize. Would you please stand up? I can't see I'm you. sorry to monopolize, but um, you said you are a teacher. If you had another 50 years, what would you like to accomplish in your next 50 years, or what you haven't felt you've been successful in the last 90 years? Is there something that you still well, want to do? Not successful or haven't done? Not, not haven't done, I should say. Well, there are lots of things I haven't done. But as with patients, I'd like to think more in terms of what I have done than what I haven't done. Because uh, the day after I die, I'm going to leave the world with many, many things undone. That's true of everybody. But what would I like to see? Well, first of all, I'd like to see my family grow. I don't mean in numbers, but grow. And I'm delighted in some of the things I see. We don't have Thanksgiving on Thursday. We have Thanksgiving on Friday. The reason we have Thanksgiving on Friday is my son, my daughter-in-law, and my 10-year-old grandson serve in a turkey at a homeless shelter. I can't tell you how proud I am of things like that, it tells me that they've learned from their father and mother they care. But outside of things like that, let's talk about things at Larian. I'd like to see this a master movement. I once made the state, uh, statement that I would like to see an Adler school in every state of the Union. And people say, boy, that's grandiose. Yes, it is. How many of you have been to Chicago? How many of you think that it's, in many ways, a pretty town? Sure. <laughs> Do you know why? Because in 1896, we appointed a city planner by the name of Daniel Burnham, who said, make no small plans. So he came up with the notion that you can't build near the lake. You've got to leave it green, except for recreational stuff. He reamed the city with forests, and you can canoe and play tennis and toboggan slide and 
have swimming pools and all kinds of things like that because he wasn't interested in just a small neighborhood. He was interested in a grand plan. <coughs> and I'd like to see more of that grand planning so that we have more than a thousand members of NASAP and each one of them doing something, whatever it might be. I would like to see Adlerian psychology, not so much as a psychology, but as a way of life in the hearts of human beings. Now, when I say I'd like to see an Adlerian school in every state in the Union, people think I'm crazy. But that's okay, I've been told that many times. Because I don't make small plans. I have founded maybe 15 or 20 schools of psychology in the United States. I traveled every weekend of the school year for about 40, 45 years to do this kind of thing. And I start running out of people in the United States willing to listen to me. So I tried London, Paris, Rome, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Amsterdam, and all kinds of places that we could gather an Adlerian group, <coughs> keep them going. Uh, one thing I hope to, people will continue. Forty years ago, been more than 40 years ago, my wife and I thought that there ought to be a bibliography of Adlerian psychology. And it was thought by the board of NASAP that that would include about maybe a thousand references if you included all languages and that kind of thing. Well. We asked NASAP to do it, and they said, nah, we don't have the personnel who can take, such a, take on such a large project. So, you know the story of the famous chicken, Foxy Loxy, will you do it? No, I won't. But when it came time to eat it, they were all willing to eat the cake. But uh, when, who was a chicken little or whoever, asked who will crack the eggs and that kind of thing. Nobody was willing. So my wife and I decided to start collecting Adlerian references. There were no computers at the time, and we incurred all the expenses. And we traveled to place to libraries in this country and in Spain and in Australia and all kinds of places to pick up Adlerian references. And when computers came around, we put it online. It is adlerbiblio.com. So, what all of NASAP couldn't do, my wife and I could do. <laughs> so, the power of one is great. Adler.com, adlerbiblio.com now has 30,000 Adlerian references. If you're doing any kind of reading, research, writing, you have 30,000 references that you can get on almost any topic. And we have English, Chinese, Japanese, French, German, Dutch, Swedish, Norwegian, Belgian, Spanish, uh, Hebrew, Hebrew, Yiddish, uh, Croatian, uh, Serbian, etc. References. So even if you don't know English, as many of our students at my school don't know, uh, they have references. And for you people who do know English, all of the foreign language references are translated. So, 
you can't even cop out on that unless you cop out entirely. So uh, there's a whole batch of things I'd like to see continued, that I'd like to see people start on, and that kind of thing. I'd like to see us grow. Because you see, as I said at the 2001 Ansbacher lecture, that Lyrians fall into two groups, takers and doers. And you heard the first statement I made, I'm a doer. Unfortunately, most of the Adlerian members of this or that are takers. They get the journal and they read it or they don't read it, but at least they got the journal. Uh, they come to a convention, they never give a paper, but they come to hear other people's papers, etc. And I don't knock that stuff, but that ain't all. Let me give you another biblical illusion, if I might. <clears throat> when God handed the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel, as the Bible said, he offered it to many nations, but Israel was the only one willing to take it. And he asked them, will you take it? And the Bible tells us that in two Hebrew words, they would accept it. The two Hebrew words <coughs> say, we will do and we will listen. And biblical scholars ask, well, that doesn't make sense. The chronological sequence is, we will listen and hear what you have to say, and then we'll do. And religious leaders and scholars haven't been able really to come up with why it was stated in that particular way. Naseb and Ishma. I come at it not from a logic, from a chronological point, but from an important point. If it comes between doing and listening, doing is more important. So let's do. There's plenty enough time to listen. Anything else? Come again. Please, thank you very much. You're most welcome. And I'll see you all after they feed us and have we have a, we have a reception, folks, for uh, Dr. Mozak and Miriam Pugh. And so I hope that you'll stay with us and, and, and for the next two hours enjoy the reception. We'll have a program at 4.30 and then Dr. Mozak will resume at 5.30. Thank you.